I guess this is what the Lord will have me give to you tonight, and I hope it's a help to you. And um, there's a story uh, about a woman named Hagar. And so I'm going to tell you the story and preach on Hagar tonight. And the title of my message is called Hurt by God's People. Hurt by God's People. And uh, so I'm talking about this woman, Hagar. It says in Genesis 16 and verse 1, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, bare him no children, and she had a handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said unto Abram, Behold, now the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarai. And Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan, and gave her to her husband Abram to be his wife. And he went in unto Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that, uh, that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. Heavenly Father, it's been good already. Lord, we sure do love you. And I pray here tonight as we look at what Hagar went through, and the struggles that she had. Uh, Lord, I pray that if somebody in here is going through some struggle in their personal life, I pray that they would get the answer that they need from your word. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, the first thing I want to say about Hagar here is that her life was altered by no fault of her own. Uh, she's down and uh, there. She's an Egyptian woman. Uh, Abraham spent some time in Canaan. When he comes out, he now has uh, an Egyptian uh, uh, handmaid here for Sarai, his wife. And uh, I don't know uh, how she ended up uh, being that way. The Bible doesn't tell us the exact uh, transaction that took place. But by no fault of her own, she ends up here. And now she ends up uh, having to marry Abram. That wasn't her fault. Uh, she had nothing to do with it. It wasn't her idea. Uh, she's not the one who put herself in that situation, but that happened to her. Now, what I'm talking about tonight is this is something that's life-changing. I'm talking about somebody who was hurt. Uh, it was a life-changing event. I'm not talking about hurt feelings. We get hurt feelings way too much nowadays. People are very thin-skinned. They get hurt too much. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about made-up problems. Folks, do you realize that most of our problems are first-world problems? I mean, thanks be to God when the worst thing you have to worry about is your Wi-Fi is slow. If that's your biggest problem, you don't have problems. Amen? Amen? Sometimes you got to count your blessings. And Hagar, through no fault of her own, this was not her choice, and now she finds herself in a life-altering problem. This is something that's changed. Let me give you a couple more examples. Go to 2 Samuel chapter 4. Hold your place in Genesis 16. Go to 2 Samuel 4. In 2 Samuel 4, we find a, a name of a young man that a lot of Christians have never heard about. But I'm sure you have. Uh, his name is Mephibosheth. You know about him, right? Great picture of grace, isn't it? If there's a, if there's a man who's called to preach in here, event, if you haven't already, you'll eventually preach about Mephibosheth. But you know I'd like to say about Mephibosheth found in 2 Samuel 4 and verse 4, it says, And Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son that was lame on his feet. He was five years old when the tidings came of Saul and Jonathan out of Jezreel, and his nurse took him up and fled. And it came to pass, as she made haste to flee, he fell and became lame, and his name was Mephibosheth. Through no fault of his own, this little boy, five years old, the nurse hears, ha, ah, oh no, what are we going to do? Saul and Jonathan are dead. we got to get out of here. And she picks up that little boy. She says, let's go. And as she begins to run with him, he falls. It wasn't his fault. You know, nothing, nothing hurts more deeply than watching a child get hurt. Right. I with no fault of their own and some, right. some, uh, some adult hurts a little kid. That's, that's tough, man. Yeah. That's tough. I spoke, I spoke to a woman just last night. We, uh, we came back from church and I spoke to a woman last night there and, and she said, can you help me get directions somewhere? She said, I need you to write them down for me because I have amnesia. And I said, all right. And after I began talking to her, she repeated herself a few times. And she said, I'm sorry, I have amnesia. My father beat me too much. That's, that's a problem not a hurt. That's, she didn't ask for that. 
There are real problems in this world, and some people really got them. Mephibosheth is one of them. I'll tell you this. You think the story of David and Bathsheba? You think that little baby who lasted for just a few days? That wasn't that baby's fault. That baby had nothing to do with that. And yet its life was completely altered because of the sin of two human beings. You take Tamar. Tamar never marries again. She stays in the house of her brother, desolate! Not even of her own choosing. These are what we call life-altering circumstances by no fault of their own. In 1820, there was a girl that was born. She was born fairly healthy, but around two months old, she fell sick. And the family doctor was away on business, and uh, there was a guy who was pretending to be a doctor, and he stepped in, and he prescribed uh, hot mustard uh, uh, like uh, uh, compacts. And uh, so back in the day, they would take and like put them on the chest and it would help draw out uh, infection. But this doctor, who ended up being a quack, put it on the little girl's eyes. And uh, the little girl ended up going blind because of it. Uh, the, the, the doctor wasn't anywhere to be found. The doctor <laughs> wasn't anywhere to be found uh, when the family doctor came back. And, uh, and, but I tell you what, that little girl wasn't raised to feel sorry for herself. But you want to talk about a little girl who had all the cards stacked against her. Just a few months later, I mean, this was back when uh, it was, they didn't have all the social programs. Her father died. And it, just a few months after the little girl had gone through this thing, and now her mother had to go try to find work. So the little girl lived with, uh, her and her mom lived with her grandmom. And, uh, and they would, uh, they would uh, never talk the little girl to feel sorry for herself. Never, 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 they were Christians. They were Christians. And so one day when the little girl was eight years old, she had a knack. She had a knack for writing poems. And one day she wrote this poem, Oh, what a happy soul I am. Although I cannot see, I am resolved that in this world, contented I will be. How many blessings I enjoy that other people don't. To weep and sigh because I'm blind, I cannot and I won't. You know, I bet you, you've seen some more of her hymns, some more of her poems. I bet you sung songs like, all the way my Savior leads me. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock. This little girl I'm talking about was a girl named Fanny Crosby. Hey, I'm telling you, by no fault of her own, her life was altered. No fault of her own. That's what Hagar was. It wasn't her, wasn't her fault. The second thing I want to say about Hagar is found in verse 6 of Genesis 16. In verse 6, uh, it says, uh, so after this happens, and we find that, uh, that uh, Hagar ends up uh, conceiving, get ready to have a baby. Uh, we find that uh, verse 5, it says, Sarah, I said unto Abram, My wrong be upon thee. I have given my maid into thy bosom, and when I saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. The Lord judged between me and thee. Now watch verse 6. But Abram said unto Sarai, Behold, thy maid is in thy hand. Do to her as it pleaseth thee. And when Sarah dealt hardly with her, she fled from her face. Notice she becomes the object of Sarah's cruelty. Sarah had a real, real in-your-face reality check. That the problem wasn't with Abraham. The problem was with Sarah. You must have thought what a slap in the face that must have been for Sarah when Hagar ended up getting pregnant. Yeah. They're all looking at Abraham and she just gets all bitter and angry. That had to be a really hard pill to swallow. You know, some people are angry with the life that they've been dealt and they take it out on other people. Yeah. They sure do, even though Sarah's life was better than Hagar's. Sarai was the mistress of the house. Here's Hagar. You got to do whatever Sarai tells you to do. I mean, she says, jump, you jump. You got to obey. And yet, you are jealous and envious of this woman. And I get it. I know one of the things a woman really wants is a baby, and I'm not downplaying that at all. You take Hannah. She really wanted a baby. <laughs> and her poor husband, what does he say? Am not I better than thee than ten sons? Yeah. No. <laughs> One day David is running out in the wilderness and he's, he's trying to run from Saul. Saul, the king. The king, mind you. 
on the throne of Israel, everything at his command. David's out there and he's running in the mountains and the caves. And all of a sudden, Saul finally catches up to David and David says, what am I? You're coming after me, I'm a flea yeah. on a dog. That's all I am. And you're coming at You ever seen a dog going after a flea? <laughs> and going like that, you know, and, and I'm trying to get that little flea. That's, that's what David said, that's all I am. I'm just a flea. You're the king. You're the king. You shouldn't, even, you shouldn't even be bothered that I even exist. You know what? Some people, they forget just how good God's been to them. And they look at something somebody else has and they get a little envious. And they forget all the things God, God's done. How about you? You see somebody else and you say, oh, brother so-and-so, they got this, sister so-and-so, they got that. You're getting a little envious of them? Yeah. Come on. Uh, that'll ruin you. Right. That'll ruin you. It'll, it'll rip you apart. Yeah. You know, the problem with in both cases with both David and with Sarai is jealousy, like we talked about. They're jealous. The Bible says jealousy is cruel as the grave. Right. The coals thereof are coals of fire, which hath a most vehement flame. One day there was a, there's a story that goes, there was a greedy man, a jealous man, and a saint. <laughs> They were walking along the road one day, and, and so finally they parted ways. The saint uh, said he would grant the greedy man and the jealous man uh, uh, the wish. However, it was to whoever wished first, the other guy would get double. <laughs> and so uh, the greedy man was kind of sitting here for a second, and he didn't like the fact that the jealous man was going to get anything at all. <laughs> And the jealous man was thinking, I, whatever that guy gets, I better get more, you know. And so then neither one of them wanted to go first. And uh, so finally, the jealous man reached out and grabbed the greedy man by the throat and begins to strangle him, you know. And, uh, and finally, uh, the jealous man, he, in, uh, in a moment of desperation, he says, I wish I, wish I had one eye put out. Because he wanted the other guy to have both eyes put out. <laughs> but that's what jealousy is doing to you. Oh, wow. It's making you, you can't see your true condition. You got it good, man. You got it good. I mean, look, there's a lot of folks living in other countries that would do anything to eat the scraps that you threw away tonight. I mean, we go back for seconds. Seconds. Some people just add water to the beans just to fill their stomach. God's been good to us. Be careful of jealousy. It starts really small and then it begins to continue to grow until it consumes you. That's what jealousy will do. One, there's a plant down in South America called the matador plant or the sipo matador if you look it up on the internet. And supposedly what this plant does is it, it finds a tree and, and that becomes the host tree and it, it latches onto that tree. But it latches on when it's really small. And that tree is doing fine until that matador just begins to grow, grow, grow. And that, that word matador is Portuguese for killer. And that thing begins to slowly creep around and wrap itself around that tree until eventually it just kills that tree. Be careful of jealousy. It'll get you. Finally, Hagar has enough. And at the end of verse 6, after Sarah dealt hardly with her, it says she fled from her face. She runs. She runs. Brother Walker has already commented on this. I won't be long. You know, a lot of folks try to run from their problems, but running isn't the answer. Off goes Hagar. By the way, if you start running, you just got to continue running. A lot of times, you know what I think people are running from? I think they're just trying to run from themselves and their character. But the problem is, is changing your location and changing the atmosphere around you doesn't change you. You got to be like Moses. When he threw that rod down, all of a sudden it became a snake. You know what Moses did? What did he do? He ran, right? That is the smart thing to do, by the way, when you find a snake. You run from it. You know, a lot of people, they got, I got a brother-in-law. I love my brother-in-law, but he's, you know, he's just not all there. <laughs> One, he lived out in the country, and so he would go, drive home late at night, and, uh, and we're down in San Diego, and he lived out in a place called Hamul, and so there'd be dirt roads to get out there, and so one day he's, he's, uh, he's driving on this dirt road, and out in the middle of this dirt road is a big old rattlesnake. Do you know what you do when you find a rattlesnake in the middle of the road? You run over it! That's what you do! Amen. He stops. 
and he pulls over to the side of the road because in his kind heart he wants to move this rattlesnake off the side of the road. So he walks over, the, it's a six foot long rattlesnake and so he tells me because it's such a big rattlesnake, you can grab it by the tail and pick it up because it's too heavy to lift itself up and strike you. It's a snake. You run. <laughs> so what does he do? He reaches out and he grabs a hold of this rattlesnake. Now, grant you, he's coming home late from work. It's roughly around 1 o'clock in the morning on a deserted dirt road. And here he is. Oh, by the way, he's lost at this time, by the way. <laughs> so you see God have mercy on him. <laughs> he picks this snake up by the tail, and as he picks the snake up and begins to move it across the road to put it on the side of the road, he crosses his body. As he crosses the body, the snake strikes. And he had on some of those... Uh, you know those khaki pants, they're like the work pants you see? And that snake's fangs latch right into his pant leg out there. Now he pulls like that to get the rattlesnake off of him, but the rattlesnake's fangs get stuck. So here he is. With a rattlesnake's tail on one hand, fangs in his leg and pant leg in the other, and here he is, and he's dancing like this, with nobody in sight to help. And I don't know how he finally got that thing off there, but he finally got that thing and got away from it. Now, here's Moses. Here's a snake. And what does the Lord say? pick it up but Lord it's a snake pick it up Moses you know what he had to do you follow he ran from it now he's got to turn and he's got to face the thing he feared so I mean you quit running and just stop and take a look in the mirror and be honest let God grab a hold of you. Amen. Now Hagar runs. Notice in verse 13. Verse 13. She's out there. And she's pregnant. And I imagine she's probably pretty lonely. And in verse 13 it says, uh, And she called the name of the Lord that spake unto her, Thou God seest me. For she said, Have I also here uh, looked after him that seeth me. She runs out there. She's out in the wilderness. And uh, I, I know most people don't like to be alone. But I imagine her circumstance, she's got, she probably doesn't have any, any friends there to talk to. And Sarah's really putting the pressure on her. And now here she is. She's pregnant. She don't have, I mean, it's just life is just pouring on the pressure. And she runs. She's out there in the middle of the wilderness. Just sitting down there. I probably, she probably cried, you know. <laughs> you girls do that sometimes, don't you? <laughs> Let me guess, sometimes you girls will cry and you don't know why you're crying. <laughs> so she's out there, she's crying, she's crying, right? And about that time, the angel of the Lord shows up and begins to speak to her, tells her to go on back. You know what her response was? Now see, this is why, this is why you got to look at the words that are there. Her response was, Thou God seest me. That meant the whole time that Sarah had done what she did to Hagar and put her in a position that she never thought she'd be in. Thou God seest me. When Sarah's really putting the pressure on her and she's going home and she's alone and she's crying at night, Thou God seest me. When she feels like she's all alone and has nobody else Thou God seest me. And I don't know what you're going through tonight. I don't know what problems have been in your life. But thou God seest me. And you need to remember that. One time Job said, I look this way. I look that way. I look in front of me. I look behind me. But he knows the way that I take. We sing that song that says, standing somewhere in the shadows, you'll find Jesus. I'm telling you, the Bible says, 
I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. You know that says the same thing backwards as it does forward. I think I probably told you this, but I like it so much I'm going to tell you again. Backwards it says, thee forsake nor thee leave. Never will I. You ever not even know what direction you're going? <laughs> Don't worry, he's got you. <laughs> Amen. Thou God seest me. Go to Psalm 139. Psalm 139. Psalm 139. Here you go. You can lean on this verse. Psalm 139 and verse 1. I'm going to read verse 1 down through verse 14. Watch it. O Lord, Thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down-sitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassed my path and my lying down and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before and laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. Whither shall I go from thy spirit or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy right thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light unto me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee. But the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. For thou hast possessed my reins. Thou hast covered me from my mother's womb. I am I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are all thy works and that my soul knoweth right well. Amen. You get to feeling down in the dumps. You leave here. You get away from all this shouting and craziness. <laughs> and you're alone. And nobody's around. You start to feel the pressure. You just want to throw in the towel. You start feeling sorry for yourself and singing the molly grubs. I want to let you know you're not the only one that's ever done that. Great men of God sung the molly grubs. I've sung the molly grubs. And I ain't a great man of God. Elijah, he sung the molly grubs. Paul said, we despaired even of life itself. Moses said, just kill me, God. I've had enough. But you know what? Each of those men found their strength in the Lord. And that's where you're going to find strength. You're going to find strength in the Lord. When you realize that the Lord is watching you, it gives you the strength over your troubles. Uh, one day there was a fellow, he was uh, driving a locomotive, and he uh, noticed the trestle was out, and he slammed the brakes on, did everything he could to stop the train, but that train finally came to a stop, and when they came out and did the investigation, they found out that it was balance so perfectly that three or four men, if they had gotten up behind the locomotive, they could have pushed it up like that and put it up, pushed it off. So they began to theorize all the different things and find out what exactly the conductor had done to find out, you know, to stop this train. And he said, man, I don't know about any of that. All I know is I hit the brakes and I started praying. <laughs> That's where help comes from. Amen. 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 Help comes from the Lord. Take your Bible and go over to Genesis 21 now. Years have gone by. Genesis 21. Genesis 21. I'm coming close to being done here. I only have 40, 43 more points. <laughs> Genesis. <laughs> Maybe I really am going to get home at 2. <laughs> All right, Genesis 21. Now here we've got, uh, the, it says in verse 8, and the child grew and was weaned. This is, uh, this is Isaac. And was weaned. So if Sarah finally has a, a boy. Now the names are changed to Sarah and Abraham. Years have gone by. The child grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast the same day that Isaac was weaned. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, which she had born unto Abraham, mocking. 
Wherefore she said unto Abraham, Cast out this bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. And the thing was very grievous in Abram's sight because of his son. Now it goes ahead. Now Sarah has Isaac. Uh, and so Hagar and Ishmael are finally sent away. And uh, you could imagine how Hagar felt as she goes away and realized that uh, all Sarah did is Sarah got whatever she could out of her and then sent her on her way. Some people are like that. They just get what well, you just, I just, whatever I can get out of you. As soon as I get everything I have out of you, then I discard you and off you go. The world's a lot like that. They'll, they'll dangle in front of you that you're going to be a reality star. They don't show you everything behind it. Because once you're not making headlines anymore, they don't really need you. I mean, they'll turn on each other like a bunch of just vipers, man. <laughs> And they'll do that to you too. I know somebody who'd never turn on you. Amen. 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 Jesus Christ has never turned his back on anybody. Amen. Amen. Some people are just use other people. They just take advantage of them. That's all they do. Uh, you take old Samson. There he was. You know what he said about the 30 companions that he had? He used them as friends. That's, he just used them. <laughs> That's what it was. Jesus Christ won't use you. Amen. Now last of all, Look in verse 14 of this same chapter. Genesis 1 and verse 14. Uh, so Abram rose early, uh, up early in the morning and took bread and a bottle of water and gave it unto Hagar, putting it on her shoulder and the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. And the water was spent in the bottle and she cast the child under the, one of the shrubs. And she went and sat uh, her down over against him a good way off, as it were a bow shot. For she said, let me not see the death of my child. And she sat over against him and lifted up her voice and wept. How uh, many 13-year-olds here? Any 13-year-olds? 13? All right. You 13? All right. You 13? Okay, good. So we've got a few of you in here. All right. You take uh, around this age. Here's old Ishmael. And now all of a sudden, uh, he's, they're sent away. And uh, they're going out there. And they're, 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 all they have is they got this, you know. I mean, what a great way. What a send-off party. Here's some water. Now go on. There they go out there in the wilderness and she's got this jug on her shoulder, you know, and they get out there, water's run out. There's nothing. There's nothing. Finally, she's got this, this kid. Now, kids, let me tell you something. I don't care how old you get, you always be your mama's baby. You know? <laughs> yeah, no, there's something about that. There's something about, something about mom. I mean, even, even tough guys in war, when they're dying, they'll call out for mom. They do that. And so here's Hagar and she takes her son. She takes him and she just, she's trying to find the only shade she can and there's a little bush there and she puts him underneath that bush and she goes about a bow shot away. Now if you shoot like me, it's not going to go that far, but if you, if you shoot like probably some of you, it's a, it's a good ways off. She didn't want to see him. She, her boy's about ready to die. Any parent would much rather take it than have their kid go through it. And off she goes. What can she do? She's done everything. She, she probably gave him the last drop of water. She cooled his head. She puts him under the shrub. She's done everything she could. And all she can do now is cry. If you ever gotten a spot, all you can do is cry. You ever had one of those prayers and all you can pray is, Oh God, you don't know what else to say. I remember praying some of those. And I remember seeing my dad laying out there and his body just shriveling up it's cancer eating it away and you go in the room you get down on your knees and all you say is oh god i mean it ain't fancy <laughs> i mean you're like preacher you mean you didn't have some oh father please come no man sometimes it's just oh god i don't know oh god oh please help help that's where she's at She's low. She's low. Notice what it says. Notice in uh, verse 17, And God heard the voice of the lad. And the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said unto her, What aileth thee, Hagar? <laughs> That's kind of a silly question. <laughs> But the Lord still wants you to tell them anyway. You'll tell everybody else. As a matter of fact, some of you are just dying 
to have somebody ask you what's wrong so you can tell them. What aileth thee, Christian? I'll tell you what. Go to someone who can do something about it. All we can do is go, oh, that's terrible, Brother Gene, huh? That's terrible, that's terrible. Did you hear about Brother Gene, huh? <laughs> Now he knows what's going on because he says, Fear not, for God hath heard the voice of the lad where he is. Verse 18, Arise, lift up the lad, and hold, hold him in thy hand, for I will make him a great nation. And God opened her eyes. She saw a well of water, and she went and filled the bottle with water and gave the lad a drink. I'm just about done. Here she is. She's at the end of her rope, and all hope is lost. And she's crying. And in that moment of just utter despair, who shows up right on time? <laughs> right on time every time. <laughs> and never in a million years would she have thought that in the wilderness she'd have found water. <laughs> but I'm telling you, the Lord can make provision in the wilderness. We sing that song, Be Not Dismayed, Whate'er Be Tied. God will take care of you. And when you're at the end of your rope and you can't do anything but look up, don't worry, that's a good spot. He'll make a way in the wilderness. He fed Elijah with ravens by a brook. He fed Israel with manna in the wilderness, and he's going to do it again. One day, Samson, after killing a thousand men, says... Great! I got that victory. Now I'm going to die because I'm thirsty. And the Lord says, hey, dummy, just tilt back that jawbone of an ass. And the place where you'd have never thought to look. Wow. Wow. I mean, I'm thirsty. Go out and get you a jawbone of an ass. <laughs> Who says that? <laughs> Nobody. But God has a way of getting you help from the place you never thought it would come from. I'm telling you, He can make provision in the wilderness. He'll take care of you. You'll be all right. When it gets rough and you get back in school, and you say, I don't know if I can take a stand, but you do it anyway. I'll tell you what, I bet you find out there's somebody else in there you never thought. They appreciate it. You appreciate it. The Bible says, Take no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought of the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Hey, we got, there's enough problems today. Quit worrying about tomorrow. What happens if I really liberal politician gets elected. What happens if they fire a nuke at us? <laughs> that ain't so bad. <laughs> Boom, gone, home and glory. <laughs> you realize when the Lord comes back or you die, the worst of your problems are over? Now look, I'm not, I don't, I'm in this boat, man. I'm, I'm in the United States. I'm in this boat. I don't want to shoot holes in it. <laughs> I would like to see it Last for a little while, at least till the rapture. <laughs> you know? Because sure it's nice to be able to still be able to go out and stand on a street corner and preach. I mean, it's nice to walk up and knock on a door and say, hey, can I tell you about Jesus? And then slam a door in your face, you know, or a couple guys had, you know, had somebody take a swing at them. But I mean, I haven't been locked up. I know other guys have. Hey, look, better men than you and I have gone to jail for Jesus Christ. We got it pretty good. Yes, Don't try to make problems where there's no problems with what I'm getting at. So one day, uh, there's a fellow, he's a famous guy he's in England, he's a duke, and he's called the Duke of Wellington. One day he came across a little boy on the road, and uh, the little boy was a little distraught, and so he began to talk to the little boy. What's the problem, son? And he goes, well, I have to go to school. And he didn't let the boy finish. And uh, the Duke of Wellington began to ream him up one side down the other for not wanting to go to school and get an education like a real proper gentleman. <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, 
Finally, the little boy said, well, I, I, I want to go to school, but the problem is, is, uh, is I have this toad here, and I don't know what's going to happen to my toad when I'm gone. Uh, so the Duke of Wellington got a little bit of compassion. He said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to take care of your toad for you. And uh, his little boy went off to school, and when he went off to school, he received this note. Field Marshal, the Duke of Wellington, presents his compliments to Master, whatever his name was, and has the pleasure to inform him that his toad is well. <laughs> Look, if uh, the Duke of Wellington could take care of a toad, <laughs> don't you think the Lord of glory can take care of you? <laughs> Amen. Now, in conclusion, let me say this. Maybe we have a Hagar in the room tonight. Maybe you've been hurt by God's people. Maybe you had hurt with circumstances you had nothing to do with. But I'll tell you what. You pillow your head in the promises you learned tonight. That thou, God, seest me.